Jane Austen. Who doesn't know her? She's one of the most famous voices in all of English literature, all the way up with Shakespeare and Charles Dickens. Her novels are considered masterpieces of the genre. She is so evidently there. The English literary critic F.R. Leavis famously claimed that the great tradition of the English novel consists of only four novelists, George Eliot, Henry James, Joseph Conrad, and Jane Austen. Everyone else is minor. More recently, scholars like Devony Luther have focused on the immensity of Austen's legacy not only as a novelist but as a media phenomenon, an inspiration for illustrators, actors, political activists, and playwrights. Her books have been made into plays, zombie novels, BBC series, and an unceasing string of Hollywood adaptations. Austen has also had her detractors. There are readers who love to hate her. You just need to look at some Amazon reviews. According to unhappy reviewers, her novels bored them to tears, were painful to read, or were exceedingly dusty and dull. More famous detractors include Mark Twain, who disliked Pride and Prejudice so much that he wanted to dig her up and beat her over the skull with her own shin bone. Despite these detractors, Austen holds a secure place in the English canon. Her novels are available in multiple simultaneous editions in several languages and their mandatory presence in courses on the history of English fiction. Maybe most importantly, she is actually read for fun rather than just for school. It is remarkable that Austen should have secured this place. She published her first novel when she was 35 and she died only six years after that, having published a total of four novels, with two more coming out in 1818, the year after her death. These were all published anonymously. Sense and Sensibility was written by a lady, Pride and Prejudice by the author of Sense and Sensibility, and Emma by the author of Pride and Prejudice. It is only the year after her death that readers came to know that these novels, these popular novels, had been written by the obscure daughter of a clergyman. The novels were successful and Austen made some money out of them. But at the time, novels were still regarded as sub-literature and it was really hard to make a living out of writing them. At the time when she started publishing, Austen was living in a modest cottage near Winchester with her mother, her elder sister Cassandra, and a friend of the family, Martha Lloyd. Today, this cottage holds the Jane Austen House Museum. I've been there myself. The curators will tell you that this is the room where Austen used to sit down to write. To be more exact, at this table at the back. We can't be sure, but it's fun to imagine that such major works in the history of fiction were produced at this tiny table. Austen's mother and sister had a modest income. But in order to survive, the four women depended on financial assistance from Austen's brothers. It had always been like this. Like Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice, Austen had always been financially dependent on male relatives. She was born in 1775 to George and Cassandra Austen, and she had six brothers and one elder sister. One of her brothers, Edward, was adopted by a wealthy relative and went on to become phenomenally rich. Others pursued successful careers in the Navy, and two of them became clergymen, like Austen's father. These possibilities were not open to Jane or Cassandra Austen, nor were they open to Elizabeth Bennet and her sisters in Pride and Prejudice. The central crisis of this novel is whether they will find good husbands, and readers who don't like Austen hate that. They find that Austen writes saccharine love stories about women who can think of nothing other than getting married. And this is an anachronistic way of reading these novels. For women with Austen's or Elizabeth's background, that is, educated young women from the lower gentry or from respectable families, there simply were no other alternative paths in life. Colleges were for men only, and women could not pursue careers as, as lawyers or doctors or ministers. Neither could they pursue most other careers you can think of, because either those careers did not exist, or they were only for men. Women from the lower classes could find jobs as servants, seamstresses, or cooks. But these careers were considered degrading for women from a more privileged background, who might find themselves ostracized if they decided to pursue them. 
In short, there were no socially acceptable ways for a young woman from a good family to make money or secure a financial future. 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 A financial future. <laughs> In short, there were no socially acceptable ways for a young woman from a good family to make money or secure financial stability other than getting married. Neither could women change any of this because they couldn't run for office and they were not allowed to vote and they were seen as being adequately represented by their husbands. And if you ever wondered why we need feminism, there is your answer. So when Austin's heroines worry so much about marriage, they're not being naive or excessively romantic. The stakes of getting married were way higher back then. For someone like Elizabeth Bennet, entering a stable, a financially stable union with a man could be the difference between having a comfortable life or falling into poverty, or even financial destitution after the death of her father. But the thing is, Elizabeth's father isn't poor. Mr. Bennett is a country gentleman with a yearly income of 2,000 pounds. Just for the sake of comparison, Mr. Bingley, who makes 5,000 pounds, is considered to be pretty rich. And if that's the case, then why doesn't Mr. Bennett leave his estate called Longbourn to his daughters? together with the profits and the rents that it yields. If you ask the source of all wisdom, the internet, the answer will be simple. It is because at this time, women could not inherit property. This is incorrect. Women could and they did inherit property. At this time, it's calculated that roughly one-sixth of all real estate in England belonged to women. Even in Pride and Prejudice, we have an example in Lady Catherine of a woman who has inherited property and who owns her estate. And yet, we're told that Mr. Bennett cannot leave Longbourn to his daughters. Instead, the property is going to the pitiful and pompous Mr. Collins. And Mrs. Bennett, for one, is truly mad about this. The problem has to do with something called an entail. Mrs. Bennett tells her husband, I do think it's the hardest thing in the world that your estate should be entailed away from your own children. And I'm sure, if I had been you, I should have tried long ago to do something or other about it. Jane and Elizabeth tried to explain to her the nature of an entail, but it was a subject on which Mrs. Bennet was beyond the reach of reason. The nature of an entail. What is that? Entailed, entailed. These are key terms for understanding Pride and Prejudice. What does it mean to say that Longbourn is entailed on Mr. Collins? The answer to this question depends on the history of property law in England. So it is kind of boring and it's also infuriatingly complex. In this video, I'll try to keep things simple, but if you want to learn more about it, I'll be leaving resources uh, below in the description so you can check them. An entail is a legal restriction on how real estate can be passed down. That restriction is usually expressed through a clause in documents like a will or a deed of marriage. A clause that can read like this. Paul leaves his estate to Peter and to the heir's male of Peter's body. It's stuffy legal language, but what it means is quite clear. Peter will inherit the estate from Paul. But after Peter dies, the entail determines that the property will go to Peter's male heirs. In other words, Peter cannot sell the property and he cannot choose his heirs. Peter's heir has already been determined by the terms under which Peter inherited from Paul. This is an example of what is called fee tail male. It is a type of entail designed to let property go down undisturbed through the male line usually through the eldest son. And its purpose was to make sure that the property would remain in the family for generation after generation. And as you can tell, it also excluded the possibility of leaving it to women. There were other types of entails, such as fetal female or fetal general, which allowed women to inherit, but they were less common. But it doesn't stop there. Let's take a closer look at how entails were supposed to work. Here's an estate, let's call it estate, which belongs to A. A wants to leave his estate to his son, B. 
but he doesn't want B to be able to sell it so that the property can remain in the family. So he drafts a will, leaving the estate to his son B and to the male heirs of B. Under the terms of this settlement, B is designated as a tenant in tail. Take note of this term as it will come up again. After he is dead, the estate will go to C and then to C's male descendants. So far, so good. But here's the twist. At the time when Austin was writing, entails like this didn't work. There was a legal loophole allowing the tenant in tail, in this case B, to bar the entail, to break it. This was called a common recovery, and it was commonly used since the late 15th century. By barring the entail, the tenant in tail gained the power to do whatever he wanted with the property, including selling it. This, of course, was undesirable for families invested in keeping their property in the family. Accordingly, starting in the 16th century, English jurists developed a clever way of avoiding this loophole, and it involved preventing the property from ever reaching the person designated as tenant and tail. This was called a strict settlement. Here's how it worked. Take the same estate and the same cast of characters, A, B, and C. A drafts a will leaving his property to his descendants. But instead of leaving it to B, he leaves it to C, who at this point may not even be born yet. C is the tenant in tail. But B is not left out of the picture. Instead, he is made a tenant for life. While he is alive, he will enjoy the rents and profits of the property. But because he is a tenant for life, rather than a tenant in tail, he doesn't have the power to break the entail. But then you might wonder, C is the tenant in tail now. What stops him from breaking the entail and selling everything? What usually happened is that once C turned 21 and was legally allowed to sign a new settlement, B would talk him into renewing the entail. If B agrees, and B often did, then the new settlement would make him a tenant for life and D would be the new tenant in tail. And thus, each generation would renew the terms of the strict settlement, and the property would never reach the tenant in tail. As far as pride and prejudice is concerned, the strict settlement has two important consequences. One, because Longborn is entailed on the male heirs that excludes the women in the family. And then two, under the terms of the strict settlement, renewing the entail is optional. B and C may decide to not do that. In that case, C will have the power as tenant entail to bar the entail. And this would give him the ability to choose his heirs, which in turn would make women potential heirs. This is what's going on with Longborn. The estate was left to Mr. Bennett for life with a remainder entail to the heirs male of his body. Again, this is stuffy legal language, but by now you'll know what it means. Longborn was left to Mr. Bennett for life, which makes him a tenant for life. He cannot sell Longborn, he cannot choose heirs, and he cannot bar the entail. And then there is a remainder entail to his male heirs. If he had a son, then this son would be the tenant entail, with the power to bar the entail. And then when young Mr. Bennett, had he existed, turned 21, Mr. Bennett would sit down with him to discuss whether to sign a new settlement, renewing the entail, or whether to break the entail. As it happens, the novel tells us what Mr. Bennett was intending to do. He intended to bar the entail. Here's what the narrator says. When first Mr. Bennett had married, economy was held to be perfectly useless. For of course, they were to have a son. The son was to join in cutting off the entail as soon as he should be of age, and the widow and younger children would by that means be provided for. But the Bennets never had a son. Instead, they had five daughters, and this plan went nowhere. In the fold of a male child, the Longborn settlement determines that the property will go instead to a distant male relative, who unfortunately is Mr. Collins. <laughs> so this is what it means to say that Longborn is entailed on Mr. Collins. It is out of Mr. Bennett's 
power to leave the estate to his daughters because the terms of the settlement prevent him from doing that. Mr. Bennett does have the option to leave them money, but as you've seen in the passage I read a moment ago, they didn't think that saving money was important because they were so sure that they would have a son. This being the case, it is no wonder that Mrs. Bennett is so excited when a young, handsome, wealthy and eligible young man moves into the neighboring state of Netherfield. Here's an opportunity for one of her daughters, especially her eldest daughter, Jane, to get married and then to secure a future for all of the others. Mrs. Bennett may seem frantic and silly and Austin gets a huge kick out of mocking her, but she understands, as Austin did, the dismal prospects for disinherited young women at the time. What Mrs. Bennett does not expect is that her second daughter, Elizabeth, will become entangled with an even wealthier man than Mr. Bangley. But this is one of the joys of reading Pride and Prejudice, and I don't mean to spoil the story for those of you who are reading it for the first time. But I hope this explanation of the entail will help you understand and enjoy Austin's most famous novel.